consideration today is taken from our Old Testament lesson, Haggai chapter 1, beginning with the first verse. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, one plus one equals two. Yeah, that's, hopefully you guys all have that math skill. It makes sense, right? From early on, you learn that math. One plus one makes two. And yet, as you go through life, you see that everything doesn't always make sense like that. For example, you think of a case where you go, man, how did this happen? This kid is from such a good family. His parents are so nice. He was always so good growing up. How did he become addicted to heroin? Or, or what about this guy? He, he's such a good family man. They just celebrated their 20th anniversary, and now he walks out on his marriage and on his family. Or what about her? She was the epitome of health. She never put anything toxic in her body whatsoever. There's no history of cancer, and now there's cancer. It doesn't make a bit of sense. You know, when we're younger, we like things to make a whole lot more sense. We think, you know, there's got to be some law of nature, some scientific breakthrough, some Google search which will make sense of everything for us. But as you get older, as you get more experience, you see that things don't always make sense. Life gets in the way of things making sense. You know, you think of something like a Hitler and genocide, you go, how in the world does that ever make sense? How does human trafficking make sense to anybody? How does a child born, stillborn, make sense? It doesn't. Well, as we study God's Word together today, we are going to look at the sense that we try to make of things. And as we look at life, we're going to see there are plenty of times where life just doesn't make sense. But we'll see what God has to say about it. As you pick up our lesson today, we go back to the Old Testament the people of Israel. And I would imagine those people were thinking that same thing. Life just doesn't make sense to us. Because you have to understand what they have been through. They have been living in the land of Israel as God's chosen people until the Babylonians came. Jerusalem, the beautiful city that it was, was lying in ashes. The temple was razed to the ground. Their houses were burning their lives up in smoke. And they looked at it and said, it doesn't make sense. Getting dragged off to deportation and death and the destruction that was there, life did not make sense for them. And then spending 70 years in captivity in a foreign land, away from their homeland, until finally God allowed them to go back. I still don't look like it made sense. Because there were some who still had memories of that old city and the beauty that was there. The walls were torn down, the, the temple, the temple mount, the one that once rang and shook with the shouts and singing of worship, now was a silent, muted heap of rubble, covered with weeds. It didn't make sense. And so the people decided to dig in and, and try to make some sense in their life. Built the walls, making the city a little bit more fortified. They put a new altar on the temple mount. They started laying the foundation. Things were starting to make sense for them. But you know how people are. Because they started thinking to themselves, you know, we are spending a whole lot of time and a whole lot of shekels getting this building back to where it's supposed to be. But what about us? What about our homes? And so they became distracted. They started putting aside the work of the Lord and putting aside the work of the temple to focus on building their own homes. We do that at times, don't we? We use that kind of thinking. Let's take care of ourselves now. And we'll worry about God later. Well, that sort of thinking set in for the people of Israel and then the work on the temple stopped. It stopped for 15 years where no work was being done on this day. And that's where our lesson today comes in. The prophet Haggai is sent by God 
and humanly speaking, his message isn't going to make a whole lot of sense to anybody. Listen to what he says again. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house, the temple, remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house, so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much? Let's see it turn out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why? Declares the Lord Almighty. Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and everything else the ground produces, on people and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. You can get a sense of the sermon that the people were preaching with their own lives, with their priorities and their procrastination. The message was very, very clear, wasn't it? It was a me first, God second mentality. These people were working on this, and it didn't make sense to them. It did not make a bit of sense to give to God first if they were going to survive, if they were going to last, if they were going to prosper. Do we ever think along the same lines as these Israelites? Well, as I said, we live in a very me-first society. That's what the world's message is. That you look out for yourself because no one else will do it for you. And you start thinking through that process, and it makes sense to us, doesn't it? If I give money away, I will have less. If I give stuff to God, the rest of my life is going to suffer because I won't have that anymore makes sense to us. And so this message that God was saying to these people, give to me and, and you will have enough, that didn't make sense. No, the idea that we have in mind is we need to watch out and guard ourselves. We need to heap up and stockpile for ourselves so that we will survive. So that we will have enough. Because that doesn't make a bit of sense to the world. The world says, I need to have this for me and take care of myself, otherwise it's not going to last. That's our simple nature talk. Our simple nature that says, you need to put yourself first. Put God on the back burner. Put him down the list of your priorities, because if you don't take care of yourself, what are you going to have? Because we know that 1 plus 1 equals 2, but we also know that 1 minus 1 equals 0. And how am I going to have anything left if I start giving things away? You see, Haggai's sermon was aimed at the people's hearts because he knew about the procrastination. He knew about their priorities. He knew that they were focused on themselves. He says, you're spending all this time living in your paneled houses. You're, you're furnishing it out. You're decking it out as beautiful as possible. But what are you doing? You're neglecting the Lord. Look at his temple as it lay in ruins. You're not keeping him as your top priority. You know, we come up with all sorts of excuses, the same ones the people of Israel did. And what do we find God doing but turning all of those reasons that we give for not giving upside down? Think about it if we would take what this line of thinking and apply it to my heart prayer list. Imagine what that prayer would sound like. We might say, Dear Lord, we thank you for having a, the lowest unemployment rate since 1969 in our country. Even while our synod's offerings are down from the year before. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for, for bringing us out of debt. 
even while our church doesn't make much. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for the 4% economy growth in America, even while we allow the work of the gospel to be unfunded. Amen. You know, you start putting those prayers into words and you see how, how convicting they sound. Because where are our priorities? God has blessed us richly and immensely. And he says, I've given you all of these things that I want you to use for your well-being. But I also want you to remember them. I want you to remember whose hand it comes from. You see, giving to the Lord doesn't make a bit of sense so long as we have our sinful nature calling the shots. Because our sinful nature says it's got to be about me and me alone. But now you have Haggai talking to the people of Israel. And he gives them this sermon, and the people respond. Now how many of those people do you think that gave generously to the Lord after hearing this message, after being called to account for for they're not prioritizing the Lord. How many of those people do you think God allowed to freeze to death? No, God took care of it. And why could they give it? It's not because they knew what they would get from it, but because they knew the one who had given to them. You know, so often we focus on what we give to the Lord, but turn that on its head and look what he has given to us. Jesus didn't come to this earth and say, I'm going to give you 10%. No, he gave you 110% of himself. He said, I'm going to make sure that I leave the streets of gold of heaven and go to the manure-ridden barn of Bethlehem in order to be your savior. I'm going to give you everything that you need so that I can wipe out all of those times that you have not prioritized me. I'm going to go to the cross where I will face sin, death, and hell itself for you because I've put you as my priority to save. You see, God loved us so much that he gave us his first and his best. He gave us his one and only son to be that savior for us. Think about the one who he has given to you. The same one that said, I thirst, is the same one who washed you clean in baptism. The one who cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Has never forsaken you, has never abandoned you or left you. The one who prayed to give us today our daily bread, make sure that we have all of our physical needs that we have. You see, Jesus did absolutely everything. God gave you his first and his best so that you could have a relationship with him. And then he says, how do you want to respond to that? Think about it for a moment. If, if I want to see how I prioritize my Lord, do this this week. Go take your bank statement or go take your credit card statement or go take your budget that you have at home and spend a half hour prayerfully pouring over that. And see, where do your resources go? The numbers will tell you, won't it? Have I prioritized him or not? Have I kept him at the forefront or not? You see, God has given us such a tremendous blessing in all that we have. And he says, I want you simply to return to me the first fruits, your first and your best, to say thank you for what you've done, for what I've done for you. Because the question is, starts to become, where does God fall? Is he our highest priority, or is he the leftover hobby that we have? You see, we have such a tremendous harvest field in front of us. And it's not a matter of, do we have the resources, but do we have the resolve? Do we have the resolve to take that gospel into the world? Do we have the resolve to go find those people who haven't heard of their Savior? Do we have the resolve to God and share our faith in what he's done for us. My prayer this morning is that you listen to the words of Haggai and take them to heart. Don't let God simply be the leftover afterthought, the hobby, but make him your first priority. 
The God who was able to make a lot into a little because of this grief was the same God who was able to make a little into a lot. The same God who fed 5,000 with a, a boy's sack lunch is certainly able to meet your needs. God be with you as you give to him your first fruits. Thankfulness to him for what he's done. Please stay.